verse 1 of chapter 4 concludes with a list which began back in chapter 3, verse 18. In this list, addressing a variety of human relationships, the main exhortation hinged upon the beautiful principle laid forth in verse 17. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. No matter where we find ourselves in life, all of our relationships should be approached with a thankful heart and a desire to honor God. The call here in verse 1 is for masters to be fair or give justly to their slaves, and to do this with the understanding that they too have a master in heaven. In verses 2 through 6, Paul gives two closing exhortations. The first is for these saints to be devoted in prayer. And in this prayer, the call is for them to be alert and thankful. As we understand the value and opportunity and privilege and effective tool for spiritual warfare that prayer is, it should come as no surprise our enemy would rather we take it for granted. A life of prayer is not a natural inclination, but rather a spiritual exercise which requires devotion and a conscious effort to persevere. Paul asked the saints to direct their diligent prayer toward the ministry laid before he and his companions, specifically that God would open a door for the word. What a testimony to see this man in chains request prayer, not for his release, but that God would give him opportunity to speak forth the mystery of Christ. And in this proclamation of the gospel, he asked that clarity be granted to him. We should note Paul viewed the proclamation of the gospel as a release of a supernatural message. In that, prayer was a necessary component to guide the glorious truth of the gospel to hit its mark. I'm inspired by Paul's humility to request both opportunity and clarity of speech when it came to proclaiming the gospel. It's not the messenger that does the saving, it's the message and the one from whom it comes. In Romans 1.16, Paul declared, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The final exhortation for these saints was that they'd conduct themselves with wisdom towards outsiders. And in the same breath, Paul mentions the need to make the most of their opportunity. In Psalm 90 verse 12, the psalmist prays, so teach us to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. We as Christ followers should maintain an awareness that time is short and opportunities need to be taken seriously, especially opportunities to reflect the light of Christ to a lost and dying world. In verses 7 through 9, Paul sends a little note regarding those bearing the letter, Tychicus and Onesimus. Paul refers to these men as beloved brothers and faithful servants. What a simple but beautiful testimony these men had. Paul tells how they will bring with them news regarding the particulars of his situation. And it should be noted that Onesimus is the runaway slave who met Paul in Rome, came to faith in Christ, and then would be directed to return to his master named Philemon. The remainder of this letter is composed predominantly of greetings from others who were with Paul. Noteworthy among them is Mark, and Paul's charge for them to welcome him. It appears he and John Mark had worked out their differences that resulted from Mark's abandonment of Barnabas and Paul on their first missionary journey. Paul is one who repeatedly stressed unity and harmony and a striving to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. This is one example of him not just talking the talk, but also walking the walk. In verse 16, Paul gives instructions for this letter to be read among the Laodiceans, and in that he makes mention of another letter coming from Laodicea. He charged them to read that as well. Was this just an additional non-inspired piece of correspondence that has since been lost? Well, we can't know for sure. Many maintain this spoke of his letter to the Ephesians, which was believed to have been a cyclical letter carried from church to church. In verse 17, we have a charge specific to a man named Archippus, but as one we should all apply to our lives and to our service of our king. Take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. Paul closes with a simple call for them to remember his imprisonment and leaves them with a powerful life-changing line, Grace be with you. 
Thank you for watching this latest offering from Honeycomb Summaries. We pray these five-minute chapter overviews are a blessing and serve to help you grow closer to God. Please take time to go back through and read and study each chapter for yourself. If you're here and don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior and aren't assured of the hope of heaven, please don't put off that important decision another day. For more information, search our channel for a video called Three Minutes That Could Change Your Life. Please share this video with anyone who might like to learn more about what God has to say in His Word. And don't forget to subscribe to this channel to be notified as new content is released. Thanks again for watching, and may the Lord richly bless you.